Esplorada. And you know what, Esplorada? I don't want that goddamn pasta. Hey guys, guess who's back? Me! It is me, the PDF cat here. <laughs> uh, one day I will be actually good in saying when I'm done with the video. <laughs> but first, a word from our sponsor. Me. Uh, it's me. I'm, I'm sponsoring this. I'm, I mean, it's not really sponsored because I'm not, I'm not paying and there's no contract and... This is not sponsored, but still, I'm moving the streams to Twitch. Uh, I know this might sound a bit weird, but I decided that uh, I want to keep this channel to be around the more historical, more mi mi military history, more history um, theme. And thus, since my live streams are me painting miniatures and playing games. I felt like it's not really fitting the Timur channel. I know I should do what I want, and that's fair. And some of you already told me so, and thank you all. Just uh, I thought it would be less confusing if you see a notification from me being about uh, uh, an announcement for a video or maybe a short related to the subject, than to see a notification, clicking on it, expecting maybe a new video, and then finding live so that uh, if you want to just see the videos you can just subscribe here and don't worry about it or uh, if you want just to see the live uh, you just go on twitch and follow me there and if you want both well you can follow me on both plat platforms if you want of course you're not forced by anybody back to the video today we will get back to a place we have visited not so long ago Somalia we're going to talk of a battle that took place in Somalia in 1993 between Italian troops and Somalian rebels during the UN-approved intervention in Somalia, the Battle of Checkpoint Pasta. How did Italy decide to join the operation and why? And how the civil war affected the view of the operation itself? And what happened after the battle? Let's start. As always, I'd like to start a bit earlier than the events we are talking about, just to give a bit of a context. As I mentioned in the Dayong Dam video, Somalia fell into a state of civil war in 1991 after attempting military campaigns against Ethiopia in 1977. In fact, Siad Bare had just been deposed after 22 years ruling the country backed by the USSR until 1977, when Somalia declared war on Ethiopia, also backed by the USSR. Soon the USSR joined in providing weaponry to Ethiopia, as well as leading Cuba to join the war. The island nation provided Ethiopia with elite troops and by training Ethiopian soldiers and aided in the fight. The three major clans that composed the cultures of Somalia sustained Bari's government as well as the Supreme Revolutionary Council. The conflict had changed the allegiances of the Horn of Africa. Somalia started looking west for aids. 
as well as the United States, another new ally of Somalia was now Italy. In 1985, with the new socialist Craxi government, far away from the silence offered by the Democratic Christian Party towards the African country, provided 550 billion Italian liras or 704 million 418,805 euros and 23 cents today as stated by the site inflationhistory.com however following the defeat of the war the situation in the country became more and more difficult to manage major revolts started to happen in the north of the country mostly sustained by Ethiopia. between 1988 and 1990 barre orders a strong repression in the north of the country to fight off the rebel the repression is brutal and bloody and more than 50,000 people die consequentially. The civil war started in the 80s become more and more brutal, pushing the new Western allies to stop aiding the government, embarrassed by the accusation of genocide moved against Sid Barre. Not even the East offered any help, with the Soviet Union dealing with its own downfall and dismemberment. To explain the brutality of by Barre, an event can be left out. It was the year 1990, and the football match was having place in Mogadishu. On the 6th of July 1990, Red Bear bodyguards indiscriminately shot into the crowd at the soccer stadium, when the latter began booing and shouting anti-government slogans following a speech by Siad Barre. Although the government of Somalia has denied media reports that there was a heavy toll at the Mogadishu soccer stadium, the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times and the Associated Press reported that at least 65 people were confirmed dead at the city Dick Fair Hospital. About 109 others were reported to have been injured when security forces opened fire after some provocateurs began throwing stones at President Barre. The event simply worsened the picture of Barre regime. On the 9th of January 1991, forces of the Union of Somali Congress USC, reached the capital and forced Barre to flee. He would die in Nigeria of a heart attack in 1995. The new government didn't have a long life. Already a few months from the election of a new president, jealousy between the commander of the USC and the government led to new fights between government forces and the USC. In the north, the 18th of May 1991, Somalia declared independence into a new fronts of conflict. By 1992, new factional armies had rose, each with their ideology and agendas. Following a failed treaty to cease fire, the UN voted to start the biggest humanitarian operation of history. The factors that led to intervention were many. As already stated, the civil war had been a disaster of a humanitarian scale. Between 1991 and 1992, the conflict had already led to the conditions of a major famine that had already cooked international attention. Thus, the UN had interest in humanitarian relief. However, there was another matter interested security. The threat of international security due to a failed state was such that the international community had an interest in trying to stop it. As stated by Ken McHouse in Somalia, state collapse and the threat of terrorism. Even before 11 September, collapsed states had begun to attract attention as potential security threats, both to neighboring states and to international community. For adjacent country, collapsed states threatened to produce a range of establishing spillovers effect, refugees, crime, arms and drug trafficking, and warfare in itself. This led to concerns about the local crisis, developing into regional bushfires, potentially destabilizing entire subcontinents. Western interests, it was argued, were hurt by the regional spillover. In 1994, for example, the director of the US Agency of International Development, J. Brian Atwood, argued for engagement in collapsed state on the ground that disintegrated societies and states with the civil conflict and destabilizing refugees flows have emerged as the greatest measure to global stability. Containment, once aimed at stemming the tide of community expansion, was now invoked toward the spread of anarchy. Analysts seeking to widen conventional definition of national security focused on collapsed state as a global as well as a regional threat. In order to facilitate humanitarian help, on the 3rd of December 1992, the UN approved, through the resolution number 794, for the Operation UNOSOM, United Nations Operation in Somalia, later known also as UNOSOM 1. The operation was also accompanied by the American Red Military Task Force, known as UNITAF, United Task Force, also known as Operation Restore Hope. Accompanying the United States were many nations alongside which was Italy. The intervention itself was unexpected in Italy due to a decision made in other similar actions. However, Somalia was different for Italy. 
just a few years prior as an helicopter pilot, I had been chosen to live with Destination Rwanda, a multi-role helicopter painted white with UN written on the side, blue helmet beret, to go and patch the centuries-old controversies between the Hutu and the Tutsi. And then nothing was done. Some other helicopter contingent from another country, much like what had happened in Bangladesh. Somalia was, for us Italians, something different. It was our ex-colony, with which cooperation ties had been kept, at times abused by individuals without morale or various origin to enrich themselves at the expense of an undefended population, too weak and without any means to defend themselves and protest. Not only the colonial past was reason for intervention in Italy, but in Rome a desire for a more prominent role in the new post-Cold War world, seemingly driven by the United Nations, as well as fixing the errors that the country made by aiding Barra just a few years prior. Thus the Italian detachment was second only to the American one in size. However, the Italians will find more hostilities from the population and Somali forces. For nearly 50 years, Somalia had been an Italian colony and was given back to Italy for about a decade with a trust mandate following the Second World War. Not only the colonial past made the Italian meet a present Somalia unwelcome. In Mogadishu, a more recent past burned. The Somalis did not forget the unconditional financial support of Craxi's government to the dictator Sid Barre. Many in the UN did not see the Italian intervention favorably. The American commander frowned on the participation. Even the Somali population opposes the intervention. However, the government seems more open to the intervention, while the USC declares that it would accept only a humanitarian intervention and not a military one. While in Somalia, the population was effectively hostile, while not too violent against the Italians. However, the older generation seemed to be nearly nostalgic of the colonial era and of fascism. They all speak in Italian. The older Somalis and they speak it well, and at least those that come to visit me when I'm at pasta have a good memory of the Italian colonization, much like him uh, with undefinable age that nods at me from afar. Then he comes near and says, naturally in a perfect Italian, you Italians are good, how's the duce? Or like the Ascari, a title given to native troops within colonial military commands and the Italian colonization. Or like the Ascari Shirei, who presents himself as the headquarters one morning near the Italian embassy wearing his old patched uniform and entering a musket 9138, perfectly oiled. After the fall of Sid Barre's regime and the consequent fall of the Somali state in civil war, his pension, which arrived from Italy, was not being paid. Thus the Ordascari had come and asked explanations. Shioe, who probably was more than 18 years old, was then adopted by the Italian command and snaps to attention whenever a column or the general commander passes and remains rigid until it is given to him the order to rest. I take the opportunity when I'm at the checkpoint to establish a relation of confidence with the most number of old people I can. They are not as hostile as the young people, who are instead attracted by the deed. In order to appease the UN, Italy sent troops also to Mozambique. The Italian operation will be known as Operation Ibis. Since the first days, the UN troops find a hostile environment and are defined by the locals as invaders, much like it was preached by Hadid. On the 5th of June, a Pakistani regiment of blue helmets entered the building of Radio Mogadishu, radio that incited to the use of force against the UN troops. The UN troops in the building found themselves surrounded by thousands of rebels. 23 soldiers still outside were killed four of which tortured to then be hanged upside down with their body brutalized. Eighty soldiers found safety in the building. The situation for them improved only when French and Italian troops with armored vehicles reached the area, breaking the siege of the radio and escorting the Pakistani soldiers back to their base. From that day on, the UN forces truly realized that they were in a war zone. On the 2nd of July 1983, the Italian command aimed at rounding up shipments of weaponry from the Somali rebel troops. Operation Kangaroo 11, or Kangaroo 11, as translated. Two armored columns head to the Aliwa district in Mogadishu, setting up various checkpoints on the main road that led towards the Italian headquarters in Balad, a town a few kilometers away from Mogadishu. Some of the major objectives were set near to an abandoned pasta factory previously owned by Barilla. The factory was on a crossing between two major roads, thus it was chosen as the placement for a checkpoint named Pasta. The era of the roundup was an area of 400 meters by 700 meters. 
Column A, coming from the other port area, was tasked with intercepting any free individuals and materials, while Column B, coming from Balad, would have actually operated in the roundup in the buildings and the houses. A force of 550 Italian soldiers, 400 Somali police officers, and 45 armored vehicles, of which 8 Centauros, 7 M60 MBTs, 20 APC VCC, and VM90s as well as two helicopters took part in the operation. The operation started at 3 in the morning. The mission would prove successful finding the weapons and seizing them, but unfortunately it would not end there. By half past 7, civilians started grouping in the area of the roundup, protesting the operation. A few rocks were thrown and reports from soldiers speak of gunfire used by protesters as well. By 8 in the morning, the commander opted for a retreat. The protesters started forcing the troops to retreat to west, instead of south, as ordered, and rifles started appearing, shooting at the troops. Italian troops attempted to maintain international rules of engagement, thus only responding to fire. The Italian troops allowed for their vehicles to move towards Checkpoint Ferro, in the direction of the old port, then moved various vehicles in the direction of Checkpoint Pasta, in an attempt to relieve the now surrounded soldiers there. On the road, Somali rebels had built various barricades to slow down the Italian advance. The barricades also revealed troublesome, for the evacuation of the wounded. The aid of armored reinforcement allowed the Italian soldiers to solve the situation, but in the chaos two BC-90 were captured by Somali rebels, and their browning machine guns were now pointed against the previous owners. However, before the fire could be opened, one Italian AW-129 Mangusta destroyed the target. The helicopters had flown above the area, requesting authorization to support the ground forces for a while, receiving only negative answers. We noticed one of our MVM on the 9th incursion's paratroopers abandoned on the side of the Imperial Road, probably due to the wounding of the occupants. It had been taken by the rebels that started roaming on top of it in the area of operation, using the 12.7 against our own as well as us. They are a moment of chaos. We think of the wars and we ask to Itaheli without a positive answer. We start to follow the VM now in the rebel hands at a distance, keeping it under our scope and communicating to the command what we saw. The helicopter opened fire only after being hit. The authorization to answer fire arrived after one of the missiles of the Mangusta had just destroyed the vehicle. The second Mangusta had been previously hit by the captured VI machine gun and had returned to base to be repaired. The armored fighting vehicle present at checkpoint did not shot back at the Somali rebels for the same reason the helicopters had waited for so long to open fire. They were waiting for authorization from the center command to respect international rules of engagement that require proportional retaliation in regards of fire. Thus the 105mm cannons of the Centauro and of the M60s would have been a too strong retaliation measure, and thus against international law, since they could have easily hit civilians in the area. At the base there were armored vehicles such as the Fiat, as the Fiat 6614 and the Centaurs, tanks like the M60 and VCCs, but between the available cannons nobody has shot a single shot. Domenico had repeatedly hit brutally with the butt of his 790, the turret of an M60, and yelled to the crew inside to fire, but nobody listened to him or answered to his cries. A reinforcing union at the checkpoint had diverted the attention of rebels by recovering an M120 crane vehicle, which was laying abandoned at the side of the road. The operation allowed the Italian troops to abandon the checkpoint as well as covering the crane. Successful in fighting the rebels' ambush, the Italian troops left the checkpoint, once the last armored vehicles with the last Italian troops left the area. Various American helicopters Cobra reached the checkpoint, signaling through the raid 5 minutes killing zone, to indicate that everything moving the area on the pasta factory would be treated and shot as an enemy, allowing the last troops stuck and surrounded to leave. The retreat had been successful, and the rebel attempt to encircle and destroy the two columns failed. The Italians counted three dead. Second Lieutenant Andrea Millevoi, Sergeant Major Stefano Paulicchi, and Corporal Pasquale Baccar. The Italian troops also counted 22 wounded, while the Somali losses were unknown. Estimates from official Somali sources talk about 67 dead and 103 wounded, but the same source then speak of the possibility of those numbers being three times higher. Many Italian soldiers lamented the aggressive reaction to Operation Kangaroo 11, especially since they had been strict in communicating operations in advance to the locals, as well as respecting rules of engagement. And official sources, which had never been confirmed, recall that the reaction to the operation was this violent because the Aliwa district was the hideout for the leader of the USC, Muhammad Farah Aidid. On the 8th of July, the Italian troops would suddenly 
association with the warlords, against the wishes of the United Nations Command and the American Command, which stated that by doing so, they were recognizing the authority of the warlords. Negotiation would be successful. The checkpoints were given back to Italian troops without any fighting, as well as guarantees of ceasefire from the rebels. The entire conflict in Somalia was rooted in corruption and abuse of power. As we stated on the Day on Dan video, when exploring the history of Somalia, corruption and abuse of power led the people of Somalia to overthrow the independent government and the socialist revolution that led to Barre going to power. In the same way, Barre's corruption and abuse of his power spread the demise to his own regi regime, much like the fight for power and the rebels following the escape of Barre led to the total collapse of the Somali state. A process that was aided externally in the cruel and silent game of economic and military support played with the Cold War. Italy not only perceiving the nation as its responsibility being the former colonial overlord, has sought to improve its image and attempted to erase the past by joining the intervention, but it was far too late. The image of Italy was one of a former colonial overlord trying to retake control over its former colony instead of a former colonial overlord trying to fix the mistakes of its past. Barre fueled this picture by defining his government as subordinate of Rome, an image that would fuel anger towards the UN intervention in the people of Somalia, aiding I did in its propaganda. As always, I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, leave a like, and if you want to see more, why not subscribe and share the video? I know that I said that the video would be about the Soviet-Ukrainian war, but I admit that that was a subject new to me. And it is taking its time to make, uh, thus I opted for a subject of which I had already some knowledge. Hopefully it should be the next one to be delivered. As always, I will leave you the list of books that aided me in the research, which are Gianni Adami's Le Ali de Libis, La Missione Italiana in Somalia, 1992-1993, Paolo Icò, I Diavoli Neri, La Vera Strada della Battaglia di Mogadiscio, Armando Micheli, Somalia Mogadiscio, Il Mio 2 Luglio 1993. Before leaving, I'd like to not forget about uh, Taylor and Francis uh, Mankow's uh, Can Somalia State Collapse and the Threat of Terrorism. Uh, yes, I, I was forgetting that. I'm really sorry. Thank you all for watching, I will catch you in the next video.